I'm Jackie Kermawi. I'm a British Jordanian life coach based here in London. My life mission is to empower those who are broken by the world. But the second aspect to trauma is the meaning we create about ourselves, about people, and about life in general. He was trying to kill my friend, basically, or at least really beat him up. And after they pray, they blow candles out and they have sex together. Khaled, how are you, brother? I'm good, good. How are you, Chris? Yes, practicing my Arabic, uh, I'm guessing. <laughs> you're getting there, you're getting there. Yes, jo Jordan, um, incredibly fascinating country, but beautiful desert. And of course, the home to the ruins at, at Petra, which a, a lot of people will be familiar with. Um, yeah, one of the seven world wonders. Yes. And they featured mm. in, a, in a James Bond film, I seem to remember. Yes, they featured in a few, but one of the ones that stand out, yes, James Bond. Yes. And when was the last time you, you were in Jordan? That would be about 11 years ago. Oh, some, quite some time. Yes, I needed space um, from Jordan. I needed to kind of uh, overcome a few things relating to what happened in my country and my past. And um, space was would do me was do me really well this year. Though I am planning to go back and face some music and just face some of the old demons that used to haunt me. Yes, can can we talk about those and then we'll we'll come on and um, focus a bit more on the coaching aspect because I'm sure that's going to help a, a lot of our our friends at home. Of course, Chris, because I was. Um, when I was reading your LinkedIn profile, it seemed quite traumatic, your, your childhood at times. It, there was some, some, yes, there was some serious stuff in there um, that I would have preferred for them not to happen. But life sometimes just brings you surprises. I think, let me, let me, I'm being a bit more kind of um, generic and more vague. I want to kind of, sink deeper and really be a bit more authentic. So let me just shake my body here. Okay. So I believe, uh, Chris, that la we all have pains. We all suffer pains in our life. And the pains happen as a result of either pain or ignorance or both. And looking back at my life, this was really my story. People who were in pain and ignorant caused me a lot of pain as a result. And but out of that, Khalid was born, not Khalid, just a name, the, the small kid, but Khalid, who I am today, was born, who's really determined to combat pain and ignorance, like trauma and the ignorance surrounding trauma and get the world in a better place. Yes, I heard a wonderful expression the other day, and I really loved it. I have to try and remember it. It's... Um, something like after the fire we will rebuild from the ashes yeah that's beautiful yeah and it yeah. i guess it means um we're not going to develop in life unless we have challenges i i suppose um it, a lot of people say that for sure we, we when these challenges come how they come, how they are packaged is up to sometimes uh, partly up to us. Um, I feel like when we are children, where we are young, we have no choice with what's thrown at us. But then sometimes adulthood comes. And now we can sometimes, not always, have a choice to undertake challenges and certain lessons and enact them in our lives before they become a serious problem. And some, you know, sometimes we, we go to the words, uh, what's comfortable, what's comfortable, what's comfortable, and then we have explosions in our lives, right? 
But for children, it's, they don't really have that choice. They're not really as developed, um, I'm afraid. Yes, I think um, I talk a lot about military PTSD, or, or let's just call it trauma. And I often am explaining to people that the, the differences with adult trauma is you have an adult mind. You can make sense of things. It, it might be unpleasant at the time, but you have the ability to rationalize and compartmentalize and put things into perspective and then, then move on from them. Whereas when you're a young child, you don't have these facilities because your brain is undeveloped and your thinking is undeveloped. And yeah, I think very young childhood trauma, your body tends to store it away because it simply can't make sense of it. This creates a very powerful neural pathway for later on in life um, where it's almost as if there's some things it's impossible to erase. It's only possible to, to come up with strategies to help you, to sort of help you cope with it because it's so deep down in, in embedded in your brain. Hmm. That's a, that's a deep insight, Chris. I think uh, there's a duality to a lot of things, including trauma. In, in some ways, this is really the definition of trauma for childhood is that children, you're right, are, they are underdeveloped, they are inexperienced, they are small, they are afraid, they are weak, and they don't have any way to make sense of what's happening. And that can work on both ways. On one hand, it can be a detriment, so they suppress the trauma, but also children have an amazing ability to get over things really quickly. So even in our, in our loving interactions at homes, there are many traumas that happen and children can get over them really, uh, really powerfully. What happens is with adults, now this is again the duality coming, if we programmed ourselves as children to suppress, then as adults, we still suppress. If we don't use the ability to make things. We just go for what's easier, which is suppression. And, um, and that is a problem because then things, there's, a, there's a, an author of a book, I can't remember the author, but the body keeps a score in which he really specifically focuses on how our subconscious mind stores data in our body, in our organs, in different parts of our body. And the more, you know, it can only take so much. And as we keep just suppressing painful things because it's too painful for us to, to feel them, then that's where a lot of people get illnesses, get, you know, uh, different aches in their bodies. The body does keep the score. And that's all where there's a theory um, that a lot of the diseases and the illnesses that we get today are actually a result of our suppression of emotional trauma that is not being allowed to escape. Yes. And um, can we, to give our friends at home an idea, can you tell us a few of your experiences as, as a child? You don't have to, you know, go into too much detail, but just so we know what we're, what we're talking about. At the moment, I'm writing a book, and I, uh, the working title right now for the book is Little Ninja, because I really clearly remember a time when I was about eight, and I was running across a field near our home, and I just, my hands were back, like, you know, I was watching these cartoons where people put their hands on the back, ninjas put their hands on the back and run so fast and jump high on buildings, and that was my dream in life. It was my dream because, you know, you could just run with the wind so fast. And that was so much pleasure and joy in it. There's so much liveliness in it. There's also power. I wanted to protect the people I love. And there's, with that, of course, comes the aspect of love itself, to love and be loved. And these are the values that really define my life. But early on, I've had... Um, my parents divorced and 
in a in a culture that is really really mean it's, it's really uh, like many cultures it doesn't really isn't forgiving towards women in a in a, in a divorce context um, it's uh, sad because my father was incredibly abusive towards my mother. He's physically abusive, verbally abusive, emotionally abusive. He, at some point, he got into, you know, alcohol and gambling. And when my mother finally mustered the, the strength to get away from that, so she can kind of protect us and protect herself and really live, the culture turned on her and said, "You are divorced. You are a loose woman." So it started really early with, with um, um, bullying in neighborhoods. All of a sudden, my father left. Uh, he immigrated to Australia, and my mother, my brother, and I were left alone. And all of a sudden, the safety was gone. Everything was new. And all of a sudden, just going to school, which was literally five minutes walk, was really painful because we'd get so many kids attack us. We're the, we're the children of the divorced woman. Um, at some point, my father returned and he started to attack my mother again because he, he wanted her back and she refused and he did not like no for an answer. So she married the first guy that, that came in her way so that he can provide her protection. But this guy was incredibly abusive himself in a different way. We ended up being kicked out of the house literally the second day to the marriage. And we, we were sent to our father and um, it just sometimes I think when I think of trauma, there are the duality to trauma is one of the physiological responses that we, we get. For example, PDSD that you mentioned earlier, the brain chemistry goes into a traumatized state and gets stuck there. But the second aspect to trauma is the meaning we create about ourselves about people, and about life in general as a result of that trauma. And that is, I th that's the most painful by far, because then this becomes a feedback loop with the, with the physiochemical aspect of our trauma, and they feed each other, right? This, you know, a bra brain that is full of stress hormones is not going to see the world in a beautiful way, and vice versa. A, a, world, a person who's looking at the world in a terrified way, people in a stressful way. I remember how I get pains in my body whenever I hung out around people. I'd be laughing and talking, but I'd go and like there's tension all over my back because my brain was like, people are danger. Um, my father started okay. Uh, he was like, okay, he's going to shape up. But then he wanted to marry someone so that we would be, my brother and I would be taken care of. And again, sometimes when, I, when I've moved to the West and UK, it's fascinating for me to see that people talk about their step parents, as if they're their parents and they love them so much. So many people here have step parents and their step parents were amazing. This is so rare in my culture, at least in my, in my perception. I'm sure there are many amazing people there, but I've not met many um, step-parents who are amazing. So my stepmother, especially as soon as she got pregnant, my brother and I were the threat. So she, she turned on us, she turned our father on us, and my father has an explosive pain in his past. And that comes out in rage and he just like goes and beats and hits and throws things. And when he threw that on us, it became really tough. The biggest pain, I think, uh, was I am, as you can see, for, for uh, our friends at home, I'm a bit fair. I don't look Arab. I'm not the typical Arab. I'm not tan. I'm not dark skinned. I'm not, you know. So a lot of Arabs look at me as if I am of a different race. And for people who understand a bit about the conflict between the Middle East and the West, the historical conflict, there's some animosity there, especially when you talk about religious animosity, right? Um, and I was looked at as the enemy from the West. I was the weakling from the West that looked like those weak West Westerners. 
And I was bullied a lot. Anyone who wanted to go and prove himself in the hood, he would just go and attack. He would just go and want. So at some point, I had to like also learn how to fight for myself against a horde of one after another, kid after another, teenager after another who wanted to fight to prove himself. So these collections kind of made me a, a pariah in my culture, the kind of an outcast wherever I went. The son of a, a divorced woman, the fair uh, kid who is probably weak because he has blonde hair and bluish greenish eyes. And uh, his father beats him up. That means he's, he's a no one. It just all these collections of things made me take away out of the culture. And that started a new, uh, a new chapter uh, that was definitely unpleasant as well in my life. That started a new chapter. Um, do, you, do you mean these things that are, that are going on? This was a significant period of your life. Would you mean something else happened then? Something else happened. Um, so here's a funny story. Um, I kind of give away. It's going to be in a book, but I'll, I'll give it away now. I was in eighth grade, so nearly 15. And our Islamic teacher comes and says, those Christians, they go to church, they pray, and after they pray, they blow candles out and they have sex together. And for those who aren't aware of the Jordanian culture, um, Jordan or the Arab culture in general, is very gender segregated. So men and women aren't allowed to interact with each other. We, we, it doesn't mean that we never interact with women ever, but really only women in the family. So mothers, sisters, sometimes cousins, especially at certain ages, and from a distance they're on. So at that point, for a kid who is full of hormones, really horny like hell, um, that kind of piece of news just stuck home. And there was a church literally five minutes walk from my house in the other direction. So the school, my house, the church. And I was like, oh, my God, finally I found a solution where I can kind of, kind of experience what women are and explore my body, my, my sexuality with women. And my hope was I would go there, there would be some extra women and, and um, the, the men, because look, this is the Arab mentality at the time, men would say, hey, we have too many women, come help us. And I would go and join in. But instead, I went to, to a church and I found out that God loves everyone. Now, a disclaimer, I'm not Christian anymore. I wouldn't call myself Christian. I'm, I'm very much spiritual. I love God, but I just don't want to put labels on, on my relationship with my creator um, anymore. But at that time, what was right to me at that point in my life is that I wanted to believe in a God lo that loved everyone, including women, including divorced women, including fair children, including those who were not born Muslim, including those who were not born Christian, just who loved everyone. That seemed so right to me. But in my culture, if you do this, then um, in, in the religion, in Islamic religion, then it's a death penalty. You're given three days to voluntarily come back into uh, the, your senses, and if you don't voluntarily come to it, then you get beheaded. And as a result, I had that kind of started um, five attempts. Before then, I was sharing a bit of traumas about my, my family, this functional family. I had two attempts of my life, one from my father, one from my stepfather. But after that decision, I had about five. Uh, my mother had uh, three times tried to kill me. Uh, she hired some people, um, and uh, that was that started a whole new host of problems and trauma that took me really a long time to come to sense, to grips with, um, especially, yeah, especially when my mother passed away and we haven't really worked things out, then I was left with a lot of mess to kind of sort out by myself. And that was definitely a curveball by life, definitely. Yes. What was the um, what was the closest then that that 
did you ever get that feeling that y- I'm going to say you knew you were going to die? It's a, it's a certain kind of feeling. It's yeah. very cold, re- incredibly chilling, and then it kind of pans out into a, a huge feeling of relaxation. If that, if this doesn't sound too crazy, not at all, not at all. Um, I I remember two times specifically getting this feeling out of them. One was when my mother got hired people, and, and she did it out of love, bless her soul. She hired eight people to get demons out of me that made me leave the conventional faith that made me love God in a different way to what was acceptable or love Allah in a way that was acceptable. So these guys, the way to get demons out, they would, they would put me down and they would step on my neck and starve me with oxygen until I pass out. And then they'll beat me up to get the demons out. I don't want to go too graphic. It will, I, Physically, I got out okay, like my throat hurt like hell, but it definitely was this close to death, it felt like. And, and it just, there was no escape. Uh, the second time, it was in a car accident, in a way. And I remember, uh, again in Jordan, I remember being stuck under a car that was going downhill. And I thought, this car is not stopping it knows it hits me. It's hit me a few minutes ago. I'm still holding on. And it's going downhill, and there's a rock right behind me. So I'm either going to be run under or hit the rock. So in my mind, this was another attempt at my life, because why else would the car not stop? And just as it, the car gets close to the rock, and it let go, and then the car just stops. So I was pulled out of, I was like, just before it, I was like, you bastards, you cowards. And I was like, thinking, is this how I want to spend my life? Last minute, last seconds. And then a second, I just thought of my kids, my two kids. And I was like, okay, I love you kids. I will see you in the afterlife. And I let go. The car stopped. I was pulled out of the car. My, I was wearing suit to go to work and it was a bit tattered. And it was an old man who had a heart attack as he was starting the car down a hill. So it hit me and it, he kept trying to stop it, but he was, he was really struggling. And the gentleman who was next to him, he didn't really know how to drive, just got the sense in the end that maybe if he did pull this lever, handbrake, then that would stop it. But for someone who has had all these incidents before, it it's really seemed like another attempt at my life, you know? Um, so I, yes, I, I know, I know that feeling very, very well. Yes. In, in our culture, I'm not sure how much people understand about the Middle East or, or Islam. And obviously it's a very vast subject in itself. I drove to India once from from Norway, drove to India and back. And I also worked in Mozambique, which is a a Muslim country. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it really brings home to you some some kind of different difference is what I'm 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 trying to say. Um, And I mean I'll just give you a few examples. Because we have, we have some, let's just say, as I'm sure you know, we have issues come up in the UK with our Muslim population. And I'm not here to make sort of, you know, judgment on, on that. But I do wonder how many people kind of have an understanding of it. And I'm guessing probably not because through my travel experience, I I had situations, for example, in Pakistan, my friend was, my friend saw the wife walking behind the husband, you know, walking like 10 meters behind as is, 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 um, uh, as is the culture. And he thought, wow, what a great photograph this would make. 
And as he pulled the camera up, this guy just saw red and he made a beeline for our bus and he tried to, to, he was trying to kill my friend basically, or at least really beat him up. Unfortunately, we had some local guys that we'd met in, uh, I don't know if it's Quetta or some, some such place, but, and they were able to go, Oi! and they, you know, they, they, they kind of got the difference, if you know what I mean. They were like a, 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 a sort of buffer. And um, yeah. that was fascinating. Another time we were we were in these guys' house and it had a, a sort of courtyard in the middle of the house so you could look up and see the sky. Mm-hmm. One of the guys pulled his pistol out and said, here, Chris, do you want to shoot my gun? So I said, oh, thank you. And I fired this rat round off. Not for anyone listening. It's not a clever thing to do because rounds that go up, they've, they've got to come back down at some point. But And uh, he just looked at me and he went, yes. I shot my wife with this one. And I said, oh, okay. What did she do then? He said, oh, she wanted to leave me. I'm laughing. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not making light of it. <laughs> it was just. Uh... And then I had a. Um, I lived in Sweden for quite some time, and my girlfriend at the time went to university, and and Sweden obviously are, are well known for welcoming a lot of asylum seekers. And so there's a significant. Um, uh, population there from Kurdistan and et cetera, et cetera. And one, one girl, her name was Fadima and she, she was from a Muslim family of asylum seekers. And she'd started to see a Swedish guy because she'd grown up in that culture. You know, she probably, yeah, yeah. she'd probably been there since she was five or six or, and she wanted to be Swedish as, 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 as you would. Yeah. And um, her father said, no, I forbid you to see this guy. It's going to be an arranged marriage. You're going to marry a Muslim guy. And when she said no, he, he shot her through the face. You know, this is his, this is his own, own daughter. And, um, and then, of course, this other situations like one time in the desert i had my shirt off which is something as a english guy you don't think twice of in fact as soon as the sun comes out it's generally right shirt off let's let's get a bit of a tan and people would come up to you and say sir sir no 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 put your shirt back on put your shirt back and it it was a bit bizarre. I mean, I, I, I kind of get it, you know, I, I, I understand it now, but at the time it's like, what do you mean? You're telling me what, what I can't take my shirt off. Yeah. Um, and so these aspects, oh, I mean, there, there was other, other situations. For example, one time we parked our bus, we were driving a bus at the side of the road and, um, there was a commotion in a field. We could hear music. So myself and the other driver, we started to make our way into this field and we saw this huge crowd and they seemed to be gathered around something and the music was playing and we, we kind of pushed our way to the front of the queue and there was about 200 men all dancing around what we would call lady boys. So... Mm. young men dressed dressed as women dancing sort of provocatively yeah and these 200 men this this was their thing they, yeah, this yeah. was their uh, you can say titillation yeah yeah and as we turned to make our way back through the crowd we started to get groped so i'm getting my ass felt and my some, some some kid that oh looked God. about I don't know like thirteen or was grabbing my balls, um, and it started to get a wee bit, you know, bordering on frightening is is what I'm so or, or uh, alarming. Sure. 
alarming at least. And um, so I, where was I, that? This was in the millennial year, or it might have been 2001. When I see here now the situation in, in the UK, we have these, I don't want to say the word, but these, they're referred to in the media as Muslim gangs that, that prey on vulnerable young women. Mm -hmm. We've had that situation in, in, in Plymouth where I worked as a, a substance misuse specialist for three years, so a, essentially a drug worker. And I mean, just, just one situation was one of our clients was a, a teenage girl. She had mm -hmm. learning disabilities, so she wasn't um, as in control of her life as, as maybe an ordinary teenager would. And she was getting abused by this gang. Um, yeah. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not here trying to bad mouth any culture or, 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 or stereotype anyone or brand. Everyone would have said, no, no, not at all. I'm, I'm just trying to highlight how I get it. I've yeah. been in a culture where the women thing is just so taboo. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one, one last story for what it's worth. Uh, we were, we met some ir Iranian chaps that were living in Turkey, I believe. I think we hitchhiked into Iran to see, to go to their family home. And at one point, the father called me to one side, took me into a bedroom opened this drawer and in it were some uh, like what we'd call beauty magazines, you know, women's magazines or, or, or yeah, something yeah. like this. And, or it might even have been a page he'd ripped from a paper or something. And he opened it. And one of the women featured in this publication had a skirt on and she just like moved her leg and you could see her underwear. And this guy's, like nudging me going <laughs> he's, he's just was to him this was like gold Warm. <laughs> yeah this was like <laughs> and um so i i guess what i'm saying khaled is i feel your pain i i i can i can see it must have been um, thank you chris and from what you say i think it it really illustrates something that very, very profoundly, thank you for sharing these stories. It's about the, you're right, I, I know you're not singling out any groups out there and certainly not Muslims or not Arabs and definitely like, I think every group, we humans, we sometimes can be capable of so much good and so much beauty, but we can also be capable of so much pain. Um, we, if you look at, um, every group, every race, every religion, there's some people who are good and some people who are bad. And I think what I'm be looking at is what I would call the collective trauma aspect. So it's that, that aspect where if we look at um, the man who told you he shot his wife, such a cowardly thing to do, such a terrible thing to do. It's... Um, we can look at this incident and a lot of cultures would judge that person on their own. But the fact is that they are part of a culture and the culture in itself perpetrates that trauma, that, that crime. And then the person becomes a scapegoat in our criminal justice systems. It's a culture that says to that man, if you don't shoot that woman, you are a wuss, you are uh, a lady boy, like the lady boys that you say, you're weak, you're dishonorable. And the funny, the, the funny thing, it's not funny how it's a peculiar thing, is that if that man becomes branded as dishonorable and worse in that culture, he'd be segregated by not only men, but by also women in that culture. So if he, here's a, again the picture. If he doesn't hurt his wife because she wants to leave him, he'd be branded a wuss, and women in that culture would shame him as well as a wuss. Mm. There's a, it, it, cultures that perpetrate the collective trauma, they have a trait. 
You either do what we want and we will love you, or you go against it and we will hurt you. And it's not when my mother did what she did, it wasn't, it wasn't purely that she just out of nowhere, we were living on an island and she thought, you know what? I'm going to kill my son if he doesn't do what I believe in what I believe. She was part of a collection of culture where men and women were telling her, you do this or else you yourself will go to hell and you will damn the whole culture to hell. Where's it going to stop? You're going to, are you going to let him go to hell without doing anything? It's, it's really sad. And it's, um, I just, um, I'm kind of in the middle of reading uh, Khaled Husseini's Thousand uh, Splendid Sons, A Thousand Splendid Sons. And I just want to kind of share this because I don't want to have any, uh, um, uh, any group, and especially men, demonized as they often are in our, in our society today. And it, like a lot of men are point, pointed at and with a, with a accusatory finger that they are the ones that cause all of this to happen. But if you read A Thousand Splendid Sons, which is a collection of some real life stories mixed with some fiction, a lot of women as well in the, in the cultural trauma uh, context, they perpetuate the trauma as well as, as men. There's an equality between men and women, and there's no question about it. And the main reason I left my original faith and I went exploring is because I was born in a faith that said a man, myself, has, has double the size brain than a woman. It was in a culture that said my mother, who was being abused, does not have the right to leave my father, the abuser. It was a culture that said... I, there needed to, if there's any testimony before a court of law, there has to be three women to overcome the testimony of one man, because two women would then be equal, one against one, because they're half, right? They get half of the, um, what's the word, if someone dies and they get half of the, what's the word, the inheritance as a man. Mm. So I, I don't believe, I really believe in equality, and I really believe that we are equal, and if we live in a shitty situation today in our world in certain places, we're equally responsible. So this is a trade that happens. I, I grew up in a, a, where I pointed about the, some of the abuse that happened with my father, but it was his, his wife in the background saying, if you want to be a man, then you have to make me happy and protect me and by hurting your son. It was a lot of the, the, the silent power of cultures and the collective trauma is really powerful. And I feel like, um, yeah, I'm kind of uh, getting off track here. It's, it's something I'm passionate about and I just didn't want, because um, a lot of times when we see evil happening in different contexts and cultures, we see men at the forefront. And that is no denial about it. But I also want to say that Cultural trauma is perpetrated by men and women, even though we only see one gender in the front and one in the back saying, whispering, saying, if you want to be man enough to ever deserve my, my approval as a woman, then you need to do these acts as well. Yes. A um, couple of things I was going to say there. One is obviously if I'd grown up in that culture, I, I could be this man, couldn't I? It's, um, um, and also even in Western culture, we have quite a big thing here where women, albeit unintentionally do, they do support their own, um, discrimination. Yeah, in some ways, sometimes, yes, for sure. Yeah. It's, a, it's hard to generalize whenever we talk about gender. It's as soon as, and it's very sensitive. And, and today there's a lot of abuse from men and towards women and from women towards men. And one of the, one of the abuses from men historically towards women is to silence them. 
And we are seeing as, as some women gain their power and use it in an amazing way. And they balance some of the shit that men did historically. But sadly, some women, some other women use it in an abusive way and silence men. They just want to silence us completely. And I've had, I've had uh, uh, an ex-friend now, she isn't a friend anymore, who said women have no right, men have no right to speak anymore because we've spoken for so much historically that now only women can speak and we should shut, shut the fuck up, really. Um, but I just want to comment back on what you said. I've met many people in my culture and many cultures as well. I've traveled over 34 countries so far, not as many as, as yourself probably, but it's for, for a Jordanian that really started a bit late. I, I'm really cry, proud of it. And I just got to really meet so many people and so many cultures. And I want to say that I don't know that if you were born in that culture, that that means you would be one of them. Today, my father doesn't speak to me. It's one of the most painful things is for a man to have her, his father say, I'm not approving of you as a human or as a son. So in my culture, people are called uh, Abu, which means father of, then the firstborn son. So if you are the firstborn son, your father in my culture would be called Abu Chris. My father was called Abu Khaled because I'm the eldest in my family. But he changed to Abu Layth, which is the, my, one of my brothers. It, he's completely disowned me out of the family. And that was a choice made not necessarily by him, but from a lot of pressure from uh, his wife and some of the women in the family, that he had to do this. And what I was trying to say is that there was a... a the way I pe made peace with this is that if I was my own father, I have two boys, and I'm really, really incredibly proud of them. And if either of them, this is not, uh, I'm not trying to like praise myself, but this was kind of came out of years and years of healing and trying to make peace with it. Where in one point, because I was rejected out of my culture and beaten, and there was a time where I was tortured in prison and I was given up to torture by my own mother and brother. And in that time, I really made the meaning about myself that I was worthless. I was totally worthless. In fact, in my first session of therapy ever, I just bawled and cried and I just said to the therapist, I feel I'm despicable. That's who I am. And going back a little bit, if I was my own father, I'd be so fucking proud of myself mm. because I am this is a child now talking looking at myself from a father's point of view this is a child that literally lost everything and everyone I had best friends say we don't want to be your friends anymore I had so many people say we don't want you in our house we don't want to be in touch with you we don't our, our uh, daughters to marry we don't want anything to do with you including my own family, which is what hurt really the most. But nevertheless, whether rightly or wrongly, it doesn't matter. At that point, Khaled, the, the teenager, believed that the only way to really be authentic in life, to be true to himself and to the creator that made him, was to follow a creator that loved everyone equally. And he stood up over and again and over and again against everyone that told him, you're wrong, you're shit, we're going to kill you, we're going to hurt you, and stood up. And today, if my son does whatever he wants, even if something I totally disagree with, but I will respect the man in him, the human in him, that decides to stand up for what is right. And to connect this with the with the collective trauma concept, where a culture says, if you don't follow, we will hurt you. We will stop loving you. I believe people have a choice. It's just a lot of people are afraid to believe in themselves. This We see it on a big scale in terms of faith, in terms of changing your way of life. But even today as a life coach, 
when I want to see, when I work with my clients and they want to heal over, over pain or they want to build a dream. So they are in good places, but they want to go into something better. There's fear, fear of loss, fear of what, what would society think of me if I take chances on myself? And I think this is a big, big missing point that we live in cultures that don't teach us to believe in ourselves. They teach us to, to follow the rat race, to do what's good for governments, for groups, for people of power, but not really for the soul that lives within. Exactly. You summed it up really, really well, Khalid. <laughs> well done. Yes, I will get there. <laughs> yeah, I'm very much the same. Um, I like to make people aware that if if you seek your identity in in you, you're you're gonna get upset. You're gonna attach stuff to human relationships, which yeah, of course, it, obviously it's a factor. But overall, we're we're part of this beautiful universe. And we're all born perfect. We should all experience unlimited love because that's what universe is. If we're all a part of the universe, there's no point hating on each other because you're me and, and I'm you in this great, great experiment. Yeah. But of course, we've been indoctrinated from children to not understand this higher power. And to quite a degree, we've been subverted from it through religion to to think that if we go in this building and we we do this then that's how we find um how we find god and when you realize that no it's it's within us and we're loved from 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 birth then you don't have to seek your acceptance in other in other people um, yeah and it's a beautiful place to be because it, it's the answer to so many of our our worries. Absolutely, absolutely. And this journey is not it's not overnight. Mm -hmm. When we are taught for years and sometimes decades that we we need to live in ego and then need to live as as batteries for others to benefit from, it's so hard to switch overnight. But um, but it is definitely, uh, and this is coming from a guy who lost literally everything many times over trying to live that journey, is definitely the most worthy journey ever. It's, it's worthy, it's worthy, it's worthy. It's where today, um, when I sit and I look under the stars, I'm connected with the world in so much more than I would have been had I still connected with the people that wanted that trade, mm. that conditional love trade. Um, I would have felt like I would have been so connected to so many people, but yet in prison. In fact, I was in prison in, in Jordan, and, um, and I was told, if you don't get back to, um, to the faith, then you are going to be sent to prison from four to seven years. And if you, if, so if you get back, you, you go free tomorrow. If you don't, we're going to send you to, the, um, to a, a religious court and you're going to be sent for four to seven years into prison. And that night I was put in a prison cell with four other people. One guy was a, a thief, a robber. One guy, I think maybe he has a pedophile, but we don't know because he wasn't really saying what he did. Um, one guy I remember in particular, he was uh, there for murder. Um, and because he was beaten so bad, or what this is what he said, maybe I don't know, but because he was beaten so bad, what he did is that he cut himself from head to toe with a piece of glass, and then his body was just had all these wounds, and you know, the 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 pus on it, it just smelled like hell. So at night, we're sleeping in, a, in really a space that is like uh, uh, two meters by three meters, like a small bathroom. Um, on a the floor, there's nothing on the floor. And I, you know, we're like kind of buildings crunched up to make space so we could sleep. 
and a stench of that guy was near to me, woke me up so many times at night. And every time I woke up, this voice would tell me, look, you have a choice. You could re- you just do what they want and you go free. And then I was like thinking to myself, no, I'd prefer to live authentic to myself in a prison than live a slave to someone else's way of life in a castle. And in the morning, I said, no. And some people interfered. I know some people in the Congress, in the, in the American Congress interfered. There was a lot of uproar and I was sent home, thankfully. But I was, that was, and in fact, I remember the police officer told me to sign some things. And I said, I'm not going to sign it unless you said that I refuse to do what you want. And he slapped me a couple of times. And when he saw that, you know, the 17-year-old kid is not going to budge, then he said to his assistant, write what he wants. He wrote it and sent me home. And that was a victory. I didn't see that at the time. But that was a victory. When you go follow your heart and follow your soul, there's a lot of rewards. There's a lot of the amount of amazing people that came to my life was just incredible. Just incredible. Um, and here I am today. So there is a huge reward. And, you know, Chris, you're, we, you're in the West. You're in Plymouth. You are in the UK where... Uh, and we know there's a lot of anti-spiritualist movement in the West, as well as many other parts of the world. And it's not easy today to say what you say. It's not easy to stand up for love today. A lot of people say, well, uh, what the heck you're talking about? So well done. Like we are all fighting our own battles in our own ways, in our own corners. And I'm grateful that you are doing your, your bit as well. Oh, that's so kind you say. Thank you. And, and, and vice versa, I should say. Thank you. So I don't believe that if you ever were born in that culture, you would be the same. I just don't believe that. Yeah, I'm, I, I just try not to appear judgmental because I've, I've, I've done lots of stupid things in my life. <laughs> oh, we all have. Oh, my God, we all have. That's a, that's a trauma, isn't it? Trauma makes you perpetuate trauma. Yeah. Until you hear from it. The difference is probably with, is uh, like I don't focus on the past. I, I look back with fondness at what I've learned and my experiences, but uh, literally I, 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 cut, I cut the past off with, with a rate. There's, I live in the present. Um, I live in the, you know, in the shadow of love or the light of love, I should say. And, um, and it's great. It's, it's no need to live in the past. It doesn't really serve much of a purpose except to, to learn from it. How, how was it coming to the UK? Can you tell us about that experience? I, it was nothing really dramatic. I, I met um, a British lady back in Jordan and we fell in love. Um, it, it, not really, I wouldn't call it really we fell in love. I was uh, kind of kind of a missionary at that point. <laughs> so I was an Orthodox Christian uh, at that time in my life. And uh, just we went on a date. It was the first date I've ever been on. And uh, she invited me back to her place and we danced and she kissed me. And because she kissed me in my mind, oh, my God, we became boyfriend and girlfriend. And now because we are boyfriend, girlfriend, and because I'm a holy man, I want to be a holy man, I must marry this woman, and I must make it work. So within seven months, we were married. Uh, that was the first time we came here for a wedding and honeymoon and went back to live in Jordan. And then after a few months, she just had enough of Jordan and really wanted to, to come here. So uh, we talked a little bit about it. Uh, I was kind of afraid, but kind of excited, but really it, it worked really easily. I got a visa. Um, uh, they've asked me for some papers. They've asked me to, I've worked hard to apply for some universities, prove myself, prove my language skills. I was accepted by a few. So that kind of was like a big push for my visa as well. And her family was really kind. To, they were like, look, if this guy doesn't become productive, we'll take care of him. Um, so yeah, this is the way I came here. And um, so it wasn't really anything dramatic, mm-hmm. I'd say. 
And how did your uh, life coaching journey start? And how did you come across Tony Robbins? Ah, uh, so uh, Tony Robbins, I came across him in a TED talk. I was healing from, we talked about trauma and the echoes of trauma, in my view, sometimes are worse than trauma itself because of the meaning we create again about ourselves and about life and about people. I was in my, my version of my trauma. I was after people that would treat me, that would abandon me, that would abuse me the same way I was abused by my family. So when my mother wanted to bring me back, it wasn't that she just hired people to hurt me or she herself, once with a knife, once with a belt, tried to uh, fix me, yeah, quote unquote. But it was all the emotional abuse in between that was just terrible. Just She was just the mother that stood up, that, that loved me to death, that when my father left and took everything, we, we literally had nothing. We're living on... I think $120 a month and $60 of those went to rent. And sometimes we didn't have pennies. We should ask us, hey, do you have pennies lying around so we could buy bread and eat? She worked so hard for us. And she changed so much into becoming this person that would just, she took all food out of the house at one point and I, and I was going to starve. So I went and worked and I went and, you know, while I was six, 17, 16 and 17, I worked in ice cream shops and restaurants. I cleaned and did everything so I could eat. And I, of course, I failed high school as a result. But that echo of my trauma meant I was worthless and I picked people who treated me the same way I remembered my mother treated me. There's a, the founder of the School of Life, Alain de Baton. He talks about that what we think of love is that we're often after people who will love us like, oh, I love you, and that's it. But that's not true. In psychology, what we're after, we're after people who love us the same way we understood love to be when we were growing up. Meaning in the good and the bad, the healthy and the torture. So my version of love was whenever I met women that were really into me after my divorce, that wasn't love. In fact, I was married for so long because I didn't feel loved by my ex-wife. Uh, she's an amazing woman. I just didn't feel loved by her. And, and I was getting over this um, really painful relationship where a woman literally broke up with me in the end saying, if you don't give me your credit card to buy whatever I want, I'm leaving you. And I was like, you know what? You've literally melt me dry and I can't do this. So she left me and it was over. So recovering from that, I was watching, I heard about TED Talks and I watched Tony Robbins. And my resolution for that year was not to cry because I was like all these pains and everything. I was crying right and left, especially when I was alone. And sometimes I wouldn't be able to hold it on a date or something. We'd be talking and she'd be asking me and send her the question and my tears would just fall. Like, oh my God, I'm not man anymore. So Tony Robbins gets on stage, talks about his story, how, uh, and as he talks about what made him want to help people, he cries. And I just saw this man on stage crying in front of the world, and he wasn't ashamed of it. And I just, all of a sudden, this kid that was lost trying to find his way into masculinity, into being a man, I found a, a, a role model that I could follow. A few years later, I have therapy. It worked for some ways, but then I finally went to a coach. And coaches did wonders for me that therapists couldn't. Because coach, therapists kept taking me back, look back, look back, look back. And I kept getting re-traumatized by relieving traumas. But the coach asked me, what do you want? I'm like, oh, I wanted a new home and I wanted to be fit and I wanted to uh, do my business. And I wanted to run my business successfully and not be always afraid and stuck in my bed and depression and anxiety and panic attacks. It's like, okay. And he took me, she took me through some processes um, 
And I went like, oh my God, it all of a sudden, what I wanted seemed real. It's not a fantasy. It just seemed real. It took me through a process where I just relaxed me. I, I meditated a little bit. Then she asked me what I wanted, why it was so important. And then she asked me to imagine it and describe it in colors and noises. And, and as my brains and my imagination became vividly real, my nervous system all of a sudden woke up. I was like, this exists. I want it. And I want to just uh, say, Chris, my program is called Path to Kingdom. And the reason I called it Path to Kingdom is because all my life, I tried to find my place in this world by building metaphorical kingdoms. I made lots of money, built businesses, got degrees, traveled the world, made friends in really powerful places. But I've lost all of that because the person that I am was still the same, was afraid, was damaged, was uh, living in ego, was putting so many masks, was selfish, was manipulative. I was trying to survive, and I employed a lot of ways to survive. In my healing process, and when I saw Tony Robbins and saw this other coach and went to one of his events and just transformed my life, I, at one point, I was doing meditation, and all of a sudden, I realized that what I was really after in building kingdoms is, again, metaphorically, to become a king, to become someone worthy. So I created Path to Kingdom, where people, I take people who are after building their kingdoms, but instead of build, focusing on the external, we focus on the internal. We turn men and women into kings and queens, because kings and queens can create kingdoms not the other way around. One of my favorite quotes when, from my Christian days was, what do you gain if you win the world and lose yourself? What do you gain if you win the world and lose yourself? And another quote from the Wheel of Time is now being a, uh, made into a series that isn't really my favorite on, um, on uh, Prime. It's... Um, there's a, a quote that says, become a king and a kingdom will follow. And we're after that, we're after being kings and queens in our lives, but we're after it by hopefully by clothes and watches and money and job titles. But the person inside we neglect, we put it at the, they're always the last priority. We spend so much money on a, on a gift in a, in a Valentine's Day, we take our loved ones to amazing places and vacations and shower them with love. But then when it comes to actually buying a healthy meal, we go for the cheaper and healthy one. We go for the, you know, we save money on not paying a gym $20 a month or $30 a month. We just treat ourselves so much like shit and then expect the other people in our lives that we spend so much energy on to make us feel worthy and make us feel like kings and queens. That's where it comes from. Yes, kingdom, I like it. Yes, we are all kings of the universe. Mm -hmm. And have you met Tony? I've met Tony. I'm a platinum partner in his foundation. And I actually traveled the world following his events and uh, he's invited uh, myself and other platinum partners to his house in uh, Sun Valley in Idaho. Uh, incredible, incredible guy. One of a few who, like, look, no one is perfect, but this is one of the real life guys that I've seen is as, as, you know, as good as they come. And he's trying his best to really guide people, change the world by example, for sure. An incredible guy. He's, he's a guy who's made me walk on fire. I jumped from a high pole. I, I broke uh, thick plies of wood. It just inspired me to really believe in myself. And the transformation I went, uh, joining uh, not only him, but other coaches, like just I've always now believe, I always have a coach in my life. Even though I'm a coach, I always have a coach in my life because a coach can really bring out the most powerful strings that you don't even realize are there. And 
And the more I transform, the more I create for, for myself and the people I love. And the more I do that, I realize even more how I need people to bring that power out more and more from within me. How was your first fire walk? Uh, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. We had to stand in line for a long time, but it was fascinating. I remember as a kid watching uh, a lot of people in India walk on fire, right? I was like thinking, this is crazy. And then here I was doing it at the age of 37. Just boom. It was powerful. It's a great experience. Yes, absolutely. I did it uh, three times. I did it in um, London. I did it in Singapore. Uh, again with Tony. And I did it in um, Miami. Uh, again with him. Yes, I like the aspect of taking action that Tony talks about or Tony lives. Um, I say this a lot in coaching. When we take action, when we're in a difficult situation, it just reassures us that the power is within us to take control of our lives rather than wait for something to happen or, or, or place that um, yeah. place that power on somebody else or something else or circumstance. And he says, I think it's at the beginning of his Unleash the Power Within book, how he came home and he had a repossession notice pinned to the door of his house and his life was at an all-time low. So he kicked his shoes off and ran along the beach. Yes. And this is the friends at home. This is the taking action. to, And it was, um, it was, uh, I don't know, a few years later, he's flying to a seminar in, he's piloting his own helicopter to a seminar and he's hovering over the building where he was a janitor yeah, when, yeah. you know, before all this, in a school, yeah. He was a janitor, a nighttime janitor in a school. Yes, yes. So, uh, yes, incredible. Not not cheap, though, to go on one of his courses. But then we shouldn't put money in the way of, of, of our development. No. Um, and there is a principle. There are people who, who like, against this kind of, uh, these kind of tactics. And these are people who are for... Uh, these kind of taxes, and sometimes we we value the 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 learnings, the teachings that come to us in, in equivalence to the investment of effort and resources that we put into into receiving them in the first place. It's kind of a duality again. It's that dance, um, and um, I feel like some. I I've certainly helped uh, one of my high school friends was suicidal. He's been um, scammed out of all his money by a business partner and he would just wanted to end it all. Um, and I worked with him and I, look, I said, look, he, he came to me asking for money. I said, look, I'll help you out, uh, but actually I'll only give you this much. And after that, I'll help you out, but not with money. I will help you out. I'll coach you. I know you can't afford it. I'll do it for free. And we will, you know, you can, I turned my life around. You can turn it. Anyone can turn it. So I guided him. And within a few months, he was like celebrating. He was like in a much better place. It happened very quickly. But within a few months, his financial um, situation turned. Um, and we we're celebrating. But in the same time, because it was free, he wasn't holding on to it like all my other clients who paid for it. My, my clients who paid for it, they knew they were investing in themselves. They were taking money, which is energy, and putting them into a process for them. It was an act of self-love. And a lot of the people that go to, um, to coaches, funny enough, money is the least amount of investment. Because... Uh, when you go to a coach, a coach can help you make much, much more than you invest with him or her. That's the idea of it. So it's really nothing. It becomes a fraction of what, of what you do. Um, not to mention the amount, of, um, the amount of life force that you can unleash within yourself 
when you live that way. But I just want to point out of something that you mentioned earlier about um, Tony and about his um, power of action. Because I know, Chris, you told me a little bit about your, some of your listeners and some of them uh, struggle with past traumas. Um, and I just want to say that for a long time, I thought I was less than other people because I was traumatized and I was not able to take action. So it's not an automatic thing. In fact, traumas, they, they, what they do, there's the amygdala part in our brains. And when we're traumatized so much, the amygdala becomes enlarged, literally becomes enlarged and becomes stronger. And amygdala does not want us to move forward because now the amygdala believes people are dangerous, future is dangerous, life is dangerous, everything is dangerous. So that's where we procrastinate, where we are afraid to do things, we're afraid to actually, we're, because we're afraid of anything that would change our current reality. If we now, where we are, even though it couldn't be shit, if we can breathe, amygdala says, okay, this is better than what I don't know out there, including success, including becoming rich, including having a happy relationship. And there's a prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for our actions, for our um, future planning, for our um, dreams and imagination so that we can motivate ourselves to move. Literally, if you are traumatized, it becomes smaller. So look, this part that makes you take action becomes smaller, and the part that makes you not take action becomes stronger and bigger. And I must say that in, uh, that's part of my whole coaching is not purely about methodology, it's motivation. Come on, come on, come on. There's a lot of healing involved because not everyone can just go and take action right now. And even if we push ourselves to take action right now, it's not always easy to maintain action. There's strategies, but there's healing. In, um, in the traumas that we hold, I, re I remember... A, a psychologist calling it in a beautiful way. It's like radiators that have air bubbles in them. And they, if you have air bubbles in your system, you can't literally heat up like a regular radiator. You just can't. You must let the air out so you can function properly. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the coaching that we do today. And a lot of coaches, a good coach, would not be a coach that would only focus on tomorrow, but would help you unlock the pain of yesterday, dreaming about tomorrow and living fully in today. This is the, the whole balance of it. Wonderful. Ch Khaled. Chris. Uh, um, this has been an absolutely wonderful um, chat. It's, I'm so... Um, happy to have met you um, for the contribution that you've already brought to, to my life. Um, I hope this, uh, well, I don't hope, I know this will be the start of a, a long friendship. I look forward to you teaching me how to do firewalks. Yes. You told me a little bit about that. I, uh, you learned it personally from Tony, right? Yes. Well, I learned it at one of his um, seminars and uh, later when I, when I was, um, let's just say, recovering from some of my own issues and everyone had lost faith in me, which they do when you're showing the effects of trauma, um, I decided I wanted to go and work in Africa and teach street children. I just felt a need to give something back. Beautiful. And I had to pay... Um, some fees to, to go and study in Norway. And so I came up with the idea that I'd do a, a fire walk. And it's actually the first of many that, that I've, or first of several, I should say, that I've done. But I took myself off to uh, the River Tamar, which is a big estuary in Plymouth. And on the banks of the estuary, I built this big fire. And then as, the, as it was getting dark, I watched the fire burn down. And then I stood there and I thought, just always got to believe in yourself. 
even when because other people won't and that's fine you you don't need other people's approval you just no, got to believe in yourself and and now i understand that myself isn't myself it's this bigger much bigger picture but and um yeah i just banged my chest and i walked over that fire and uh yeah it's just symbolic isn't it it's symbolic that we have the power within we're invincible and we we've we've just got to go forward even when we don't have the support of others and I'm, I'm guessing if I hadn't have done that on the banks of the the river that night we we wouldn't be having this great chat now so mm -hmm. absolutely I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a a wonderful life well done well done well, I look forward to learning the techniques from you yes um, and uh, if people want to get hold of you uh, for your coaching or your your speaking What's the best way to do that? So uh, thank you for this. I uh, have a website, pathtokingdom.com. And um, I have, I'm on social media. I have an amazing uh, team that uh, helps me be present and available on social media. My handle is uh, coach.khaled. So um, that's K-H-A-L-E-D. So coach.khaled, you could find me on all social media, just as we bumped into each other, Chris. And um, just I want to say for one of my ways of giving back, I'm, I'm really grateful for my journey. I'm really grateful for what the universe has given me. I know it, I had to lose a lot to get here, but I've also gained a lot. And my, I have, um, I have it in my, in my bedroom, the sign that I uh, created about my mission in life, which is to kind of a symbolically to be like the sun. Because remember when I talked about the ninja and I, since I was a child soaring with the wind, so the sun is always there soaring, soaring with joy. So I, my mission in life is to soar with joy shine with compassion and guide my soul tribe into their own miracles. Because I feel like I believe that where I am today is a miracle where I come from and where I am today is a huge miracle. And if there's anything I can do to guide anyone into their own miracle, I would do my utmost best. That's why I studied. That's why I traveled the world. That's why I spent so much invested $150,000 in learning the techniques that I share with my clients today. And anyone that needs help, please get in touch. There is a, a I'll give you also Chris a link if you if you'd like, but there is a link on my website to reach out where they can schedule a call with me free of charge. And free of charge, I'm more than happy to just create a strategy with them on how to move from a place of being stuck in yesterday's stories, in, in the meanings that our past had made us create about ourselves and about lives into a totally new future. I fantasized when I was in my 30s. I had money and I had, I had a lot of things, but I was lost. And I wished, I didn't know anything that life coaches existed. And I remember watching movies and I was thinking, it was Hugh Jackman at the time, I think, in a movie. And I was like thinking, I wish this awesome guy would just adopt someone like me. Not necessarily adopt him, but like, you know, teach me the ways on how to really live an awesome life, how to master life, how to master relationships, how to master confidence, how to master being a man or being, you know, if you're a woman, being a woman, right? How to unlock my real core energy. I had no idea these guys existed, but they do exist. And... Um, if you're listening, I am here. And if I can do anything for you, I will tell you. And if I can't, I will tell you. And I would be more than happy to at least sit with you free of charge and create a, a clarity session, a strategy session. Some of the things that you could do in your life today that will help you just gain momentum and really empower your action in your life and create the kingdom that you deserve. There you go, friends. You cannot lose. We, so I would uh, take this man up on his offer. Absolutely. Khaled, stay Chris. on the line. 
I'm going to be practicing my chalets uh, <laughs> for the rest of the day. Stay on the line so I can thank you, um, thank you properly. But for the purposes of this recording, it's been absolutely wonderful chatting to you. Thank you for sharing um, some uh, challenging details of, of of your life. It's it's really appreciated, and I massively wish you all the all the best going forward. Chris, thank you so much for having me here and for giving me a platform to speak and express the good and the bad that makes me who I am today. I'm really, really grateful. I'm really grateful for getting to know you a bit more. And uh, someone like you is definitely, people like you are definitely a rare commodity on this planet. And I'm really grateful to have met you. Thank you. To our friends at home, We're grateful to have you as well. Massive love to you all. Please look after each other. If you could like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And we'll see you next time.